please be seated and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can sing such a thing in this world where sin and pain and death and heartache abound. Out of all of these things that happen around us and to us, there is our own sin that we are acutely aware of and yet not aware of enough. And because of Christ, because our sin was nailed to the cross, Lord, we can sing, it is well with our soul. What happens to us, what goes on around us, is nothing in comparison to what has taken place inside of us because of you. And so, Father, we rejoice and we give thanks and we praise you, we worship you. And as we've been saying from First Peter, we want to offer ourselves worship of you as we are a priesthood. We're called to live our lives for your glory. We want to do that. Help us to grow in that. And as we seek to do that, I pray that we would always be stayed on the truth of the gospel, that we would always come back to the reality of who you are and what you have done, that we would always come back to the truth that you sent your son and that he laid his life down willingly as a perfect substitute on our behalf so that we might find grace, so that we might experience the forgiveness of sins, that we might know the love of God, that we might be brought from spiritual death to spiritual life by your great work. Father, we love you. We praise you for these things, and we pray that the truth of the things that we've just sung of regarding the gospel, Lord, that it would impact even now how we listen to your word, how we submit to your truth. Lord, that you would use your word in the ways that you love to in the lives of your people to make us more like Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please open your Bible to the book of First Peter. We've been making our way through First Peter with a couple of brief breaks over the holiday. We're back in chapter 2 this evening. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 20. So First Peter chapter 2. We know that the gospel has an impact on us positionally before God. Even as I just prayed. We were once separated from God because of our sin. We were at enmity with God in our sin. And because of God's work in the gospel through his son, Jesus, we are now reconciled to God. If you are a Christian, if you're in Christ, we are children of God. We have peace with God. We enjoy fellowship with God. We have eternity to look forward to in God's presence. But Peter's been helping us see not only those glorious truths as he put them forth in chapter 1, but he's also helping us see the significant impact that the gospel has for us in this life now. That we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, we are the people of God, he calls us in chapter 2 verse 10. And all that God has done for us that impacts our relationship with him also has an impact on our relationship with the world, on our functioning in this world. And more specifically, how we are to live in the world in light of all of the benefits that we've received in Christ. We've seen that we are called to proclaim God's excellencies. We keep our behavior excellent in the world so that when their attacks come, and they will come, we will experience attacks from the world, persecution from the world. When they come, they actually hear our testimonies of the truth and see our lives of integrity and holiness, and God may in fact use those things to save some. Just think about that for a moment. You who have experienced the grace of God Then again, by God's grace, through his grace, walk in obedience, live faithfully, and proclaim truth diligently, and some will actually glorify God in the day of visitation as a result of your life. You are a means of God's sovereign work in people whom he will save. What a privilege. We are living witnesses in the world. That's what God calls each one of us to be. 
The Christian life is not just about enjoying God's glory for all eternity, but we actually are called to live for God's glory now. And Peter has launched into this penetrating rubber meets the road instruction for us about how to interact as aliens and strangers in this world for the glory of God. And he spoke about the Christian's relationship with governing authorities and then launched into, in rapid fire succession, the call to honor all people, to love the brotherhood, to fear God, and to honor the king. Well, next he's going to dive right into the Christian's call from God regarding their disposition towards those who hold authority over them in society, namely in their work, in the workplace. Peter is really narrowing in on these real-life circumstances we find ourselves in. This is about as practical as it gets for Christian living, and he's going to follow this section up in chapter 3, launching into the home, specifically marriages, addressing husbands and wives. So read with me our passage for this evening, starting in verse 18, and we'll work our way through verse 20. Peter says in verse 18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Well, the believer must understand two considerations in navigating authority in the workplace. The believer, the Christian, must understand two considerations in navigating authority in the workplace. There are two considerations that Peter puts forth in our passage that the believer must embrace. We must know in regards to how we are to function and how we navigate the authority that we are under in our society, in our work, in the workplace. Now, you might be wondering, Where do you get workplace from? I see servant and master language here. And yes, when we see the term servant and master, we typically think slave and master, and maybe even slaves and master relationships of the last couple centuries in America. And a lot has been written and talked about recently, and really helpful commentary on resources, uh, or commentary and resources on the term bondservant or slave the word in the Greek that we know as doulos and the importance of that term and how it was used. And that word does take a more specific slave master force to it. Peter does not use that term here. He uses the general broad term for servant. It's it's used only three other times in the New Testament and it has the idea of of a domestic or a house servant. Someone under a house master. It's a broad term that could be used for someone under contract or obligation to a master, but it could also be used to describe someone who had been freed but remained in service or employment by a house owner or a master of that sort. So it is anyone who is under authority that functions really as their boss, really as their manager. You could say, submit to your employer, Or submit to your manager, submit to your boss, submit to the one who holds authority that designates or assigns to you your responsibilities in everyday life and duties. And so this term isn't restricted to slavery where individuals tragically were treated like animals or even worse. It could include that, but it's also much broader than that. In fact, it could also include Servants that were afforded many benefits. Many who served were enabled to receive and be trained in a trade or a a practice, a specific practice, receive education. They could buy their freedom at times. They may have professions that contributed in significant ways to society, like a physician and so on. So when Peter using this term, it's broad, it could be slave and it could be employees. So this term really has to do with those who have authority over you in your workplace and society, particularly those who have authority over you in in your work that the Lord has given to you. 
And so in light of God's work in our lives, how does his work in us intersect in the most practical, everyday ways of our lives? Well, submit yourself to governing authorities. And now, that's what we saw previously, and now submit yourself to those in authority over you in your workplace. With that in mind, let's look at the two considerations the believer must understand in navigating authority in the workplace. First, the believer must understand the command to faithfully submit. The believer must understand the command to faithfully submit. Right there at the beginning of verse 18, servants, or you could say employees, be submissive to your masters or bosses or managers. It's literally submitting yourself as an ongoing action. Submit and continue to submit to them. This is the standing, continual, ongoing practice for the servant. And like submission that is to be given to governing authorities, this submission is not to be begrudging. It's not a submission where your heart is really chafing against that authority, but you're simply doing what they say. We likened it to a child that's told to clean their room, and they say fine and yell, you know, yell fine and stomp away towards their bedroom and close the door, and you hear things flying up against the wall. That's not what we're talking about at all. This is not just act of submission, actions of submission. It's a disposition of the heart of submission to those whom God has put in authority over you. This is a willing submission of obedience. And he says, do it with all respect. Do you see that in verse 18? With all respect, servants, be submissive to your masters. With all respect. It, it, now this word with all respect, this idea of respect, it, it's with all phobos. It's the word we get phobia from. What is phobia? Fear. With all fear. It's fear or reverence. So you could say, submit to your masters with all fear. And the fear is not earthly temporal fear of the master. What they might rather do to you if you don't obey. Rather, it's a fear. It's a reverence of God that you wouldn't sin against him in your behavior against your manager or boss or master. This is a reverential fear of God. You are to conduct yourself in your disposition and attitude with submission as if God himself is your direct employer. That's the call for the Christian life. This is a reverential fear of God. And he says with, with all, that means it isn't a half-hearted or it, it doesn't ebb and flow this submission, this reverential acknowledgement of the presence of the Lord in all things submission. It doesn't just kind of come and go depending on the circumstance. You're to always have this. This is always to characterize the Christian. You submit to your employer with trepidation that to not submit in all things would be to transgress against God. And again, as we talked about with governing authorities, the limitations of this submission, right? We just feel in our hearts that pull, really, in all things? Yes, in all things, except for the obvious exceptions to where our managers or the government or our boss or a master is calling you to do something directly against God's instruction for you. So asking you to do something against God or calling you to not do something that God calls you to do. You could simply say, if disobedience to God is involved, then you disobey men rather than God. And then look what he says next. This should just floor us. He says, not only are we to submit to those masters who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. If there's any impulse in our heart of a yeah, but or conditions that we might want to place on when we submit and when we show respect and when we honor those in authority over us, Peter clarifies for us. We also submit with all respect, acknowledging God's presence to those who are unreasonable. And this goes beyond our natural inclination and even our, our natural desires and impulses towards justice. Justice. 
right? There's a, there is a good inclination in us to desire justice. Now, the reality is, is that most of us really desire justice except when thinking about ourselves. We want everyone else to be just towards us or just towards others, uh, but when the call is for us to receive what we are due before God, we should never want what we actually deserve before God. And so in this time, as Peter is writing, this term is, is so broad. This command applies to simply an unreasonable boss who has unreasonable expectation, but it also extends to cruel, unjust, dehumanizing masters. The categories that Peter has in mind here, we don't experience in our society today. His went far beyond the injustices that we may experience This is sobering. And I see this here, and I know that in my own heart, I feel this sense of justice rise up, and I want to interject, but, but that's not right. God says, be submissive to those who are unreasonable. Your bosses or your manager's reasonableness is not the catalyst for your submission. And the word unreasonable is probably too soft here. This word being used is harsh or literally crooked or bent. A crooked or bent master. Those with moral perversion or immoral or wicked masters. And not necessarily in a sensual way, but just in a, a moral way. Those who are sensual or, or immoral morally. They're crooked. They're bent. Unjust. When they're unfair, cruel, unreasonable, capricious, when you submit with all respect to that kind of leader, it has a powerful testimony for the Lord. It is a powerful gospel witness. And how easy is it for us to justify poor work performances or to rationalize our work effort? If they want me to work harder, they need to pay me what I'm worth. To believe that the demands are unreasonable and so we find ourselves being aloof in our work. To come home and complain to our spouse about what is wrong with our boss or manager. To speak poorly of them in front of other coworkers or friends. To not submit, to not show respect, to value temporal justice over diligent obedience of what call, God calls the Christian to do. As believers, we know that God has ordained everything. So we don't need to complain. Rather, as Tom taught last week, the believer can give thanks in all things. Yes, even unreasonable, unjust managers. We can give thanks. God is not only behind these things, but he is actively ordaining them, bringing them to pass with divine intention for his glory and for his people's good. His divine intention accomplishes both what brings glory to himself and what ultimately is good for the believer. This is what Paul gets at in Romans 8 when he talks about the confidence that we can have in God's divine providence. He's working all things together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And if he did not spare his own son, but offered him up freely, how much more will he give us all things? And those all things that Paul is talking about is all things that we need to be able to live for him and glorify him and persevere under hardship and difficulties in this life. And so listen, where injustice exists, yes, we can speak out against it. We have the freedom to do that. If given the means, we can seek to eradicate injustices. Those aren't bad endeavors or bad things that we can consume our time with or occupy ourselves with. But the specific call from Scripture is not for the Christian to go right every injustice that we see in the world. It's to submit under the injustices that we might find ourselves under. To be faithful in the midst of those things. To trust God in them. 
knowing that he is not distant in our suffering, but he is near in our suffering, and he uses our suffering. As we saw in chapter one, the refining of your faith when it's tested by fire, and your faith is proven genuine, it is more precious than gold. God is typically doing a million things we can't see or understand in this life through every difficulty, through every persecution, through every trial that we face, through every hardship that we experience. And if nothing else, all he was doing was allow us, allowing us to see our faith on display that it's genuine. Just the benefit of that is more precious than any treasure we could experience in this life. When we find ourselves being mistreated and experiencing temporal injustice against us, we can endure it, we can accept it, we can trust God in it, knowing that he's not distant in our suffering, but he is near to us and he uses us, uses it. And Peter in verse 21 is going to look at Christ. We're going to see that next week and then not the following week. I'll be out of town, but the week after that, We will be looking at verses 21 through 25, and we will see Christ as the perfect example. In fact, our specific example for us of one who suffers well, the ultimate injustice. Christ's suffering did not catch the Father off guard. It was clearly part of the eternal plan of God, and in it, God had divine intention for our good. And all of this communicates a sobering reality that in this life, we will experience suffering. It shouldn't catch us off guard. We will experience injustice. We will experience poor treatment from others. We try to avoid suffering at every opportunity. Understandably so, it's not particularly enjoyable. I don't know of anyone who, when asked how they're doing, responds, I really could be better. Well, what do you mean? Well, I really haven't experienced any suffering recently. All of the people in authority over me have been really just, really reasonable. But hey, there's always tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow my manager will be unreasonable. I can only hope. Nobody thinks that way. Nobody talks that way. And yet for the believer, we're not to be unhinged when suffering comes, when hardship comes. God has divine purpose in it, and his call for us is to bear up under it. It's not our natural inclination. God is calling us to be faithful under his providence, to trust him when suffering comes, when injustices come, to be faithful, to be holy, to be submissive to those in authority over us, to have reverential fear in that moment of God that drives you to diligent obedience and faithfulness in your submission to those who have authority over you. Every time we lack faithful submission to our boss or our manager, we miss an opportunity to glorify God. This is helpful to realize unreasonable bosses are not an obstacle to what God is seeking to accomplish in and through us. Sometimes it feels that way. Most of the time it feels that way. I've got a responsibility. I've got an agenda. I need to be excellent in my work. And now my boss is being unreasonable. There's no way I can meet my goals. Faithfulness looks like meeting my goals. I'll never be able to reach them. And so this boss, this manager is an obstacle to me doing what God calls me to do. It's just not the case. The reality in light of this is that unreasonable expectations and demands are not obstacles to us being able to glorify God or make much of the gospel. Actually, in walking in obedience and submission, we do make much of Christ. Oftentimes, these circumstances are a means of giving much glory to God, gaining favor from him, as we'll see in a moment. And this leads into our next consideration the believer must understand in navigating authority in the workplace. And that's number two, the consequence of faithfulness in suffering. And so we saw, number one, the command to faithfully submit. And now, number two, the consequence of faithfulness in suffering. 
Peter tells us the consequence or the result or the outcome of suffering righteously or faithfully under unjust masters. And look again at verse 19 and 20. What is the consequence? What is the outcome? For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Peter says for this, and the this is suffering under unreasonable masters, it finds favor or it finds charis, grace. Not God's salvific favor or grace, but it brings God's grace, it brings grace from God into your circumstances, into your situation, for your heart to come under the Lord in your circumstances. And sometimes this grace is reprieved from the suffering. It's maybe an advantage in the suffering from your employer. Not always. Sometimes the grace is to endure the suffering that you continue to experience with joy and contentment and perseverance. Sometimes it may be an ear with a coworker to proclaim the gospel because your life has demonstrated conviction and is compelling to those around you. Why are you the way that you are? Why do you work so faithfully? You're making us look bad. Let me tell you about Jesus. This is helpful because if you have found yourself not experiencing this kind of grace in your employment, it, sh- it should be a cause for, you to, cause for you to evaluate. Have I been submitting to my boss? Have I been suffering for what is right? The consequence of faithfulness and suffering under unjust management is God's favor, God's grace present in your suffering. And Peter says, for if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows, there is the grace of a clean conscience before God when you persevere and endure and trust God in the midst of mistreatment and suffering for what is right. When you don't harbor resentment, when you've been promised this resource or this promotion or this raise and you get passed up again, and you show up at work joyfully and work heartily and faithfully, it finds favor with God. And then look at verse 20. Peter says, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Have you ever been this person or known someone like this? There's an unreasonable manager and an employee is always complaining always pushing the edges of what's expected, doing the bare minimum, or even trying to set up the boss to look bad. We got to position things where he gets his comeuppance. He gets what's due to him. I'm not going to bail him out again. He's got to reap what he sows. I only respect the respectable. I'll show him, and this behavior may incite even more harsh treatment, and then you feel vindicated in that. See, look at how I'm suffering. Well, what credit is that? The clear answer is none. There's no credit before the Lord in that. There's no grace for you in that, no favor from God for you when you are sinning and suffering for your own sinful actions and attitude and behavior. That kind of behavior has no gospel witness, no teeth of integrity or righteousness to it. That, in fact, is just how the world acts and thinks. That's how the world responds. And the suffering that ensues is not unjust. It's suffering because of your own sin. Yet humble service, faithful service, diligence, careful speech, actions that honor and respect your manager or boss, a humble spirit that seeks to do your job unto the Lord in faithfulness, that incites God's grace. And again, we're not talking saving grace, but just his practical favor for you as you navigate the hardships of this life. Again, if nothing else, it gives you a clear conscience before the Lord that you're bearing up under unjust suffering patiently. You can have full confidence that God's grace 
a balance on the situation. Think about that for a moment. In all of the hardship and all of the difficulty day in and day out experiencing the same unjust treatment, when you are suffering submissively, patiently, graciously, being controlled in your heart's disposition towards your boss, you can have confidence that God's favor or God's grace abounds in the situation even if you don't see it in that moment. The reality of what God says is not dependent upon whether or not we see it practically playing out the way that we think it should be played out. We can simply trust God that he's doing it. This kind of endurance, this kind of suffering and godliness, this is what has a testimony for the gospel. To be temperate, to be self-controlled, to be faithful and respectful, to work hard under unreasonable expectations without anxiety and anger or bitterness. God uses this kind of life in extraordinary ways. I remember years ago working for a bank And there was a shift in management where we went from being predominantly service-oriented to being predominantly sales-oriented. And all of a sudden, we had these sales goals that were just off the charts. They were unattainable, unreasonable. And every single person that came into the bank, we had to offer credit cards and checking accounts. Oh, you have one. You really need two checking accounts. Why? Because I got to hit my goals. And there was so much pressure from management to sell, sell, sell. And there was so much complaining that would take place in the workplace. I remember having to intentionally guard my heart from jumping into those complain sessions, putting my head down joyfully, just being faithful, trusting the Lord with what came from my efforts. It's hard. It's not easy. It's what God calls us to. God uses that kind of life in extraordinary ways as a witness and testimony of his greatness. Conversely, to always gripe, to always complain, I'm undervalued, overworked, that kind of attitude neglects to recognize the Lord's providence and it fails to see his sovereign hand in your life. You're not questioning your boss's integrity in that moment. You're questioning God's. This is why Paul says in Philippians 2, to do all things without grumbling or disputing, namely grumbling against God, disputing against God. God, why aren't things this way? Why didn't you do it differently? Why is my life this hard? Why is there no justice? I was just talking about the guys, uh, talking with the guys, Tom and Tyler, this week, how I'd love to spend some time as a church in the book of Habakkuk, and we probably will at some point in the future take some time to work through that book. It answers the question, why do the unjust prosper and the righteous suffer? And God gives a perfect, wonderful answer and changes none of Habakkuk's practical circumstances. Now listen, we live in a culture and a time where to work in a job where your boss or the company is corrupt, it's not a binding mandate. Right? We have the freedom to look for other jobs if we don't like the one that we're in. You have the freedom to interview elsewhere, to look for other opportunities. But it's a good exercise for our own heart. Are we running away from the call to submit because we don't like God's instruction? Or do we think, in light of God's providence, that our skills and our practice would be better suited elsewhere? We have the freedom to make those decisions. Just because you're in employment that may be unjust doesn't mean you have to stay there forever. If you have a contract, you need to honor that contract. And as long as you are under that employer, you need to be faithful. There's no senioritis. I'm interviewing elsewhere. I'm going somewhere else. So I can, I cannot serve faithfully. I cannot be submissive because I'm already out the door although you're not yet. And so do we have the freedom to leave a job that is unreasonable? Absolutely. Watch your own heart's contentment, though. If, if our impulse is to run 
every time things get hard, we are going to constantly be running. If our impulse is to run every moment our manager sins against us, we are going to constantly be running. So is there a freedom there? Of course there is. Do we need to shepherd our hearts to run towards submission regardless of the reasonableness or unreasonableness of those in authority over us? Absolutely we do. Both of those things can coexist. We have to understand that people in these relationships that God puts us in, in our culture, God actually saves some. He uses our disposition as a means of his grace in their lives, as a means of grace in our lives as well. We must be faithful, we must be respectful. And think of the impact that flows from this for the gospel. Can you imagine being an an awful employee under an unjust employer? Then that employer coming to Christ and showing up here? Wait, you go to church here? I remember you. You were a horrible employee. <laughs> think, of, think of what that does for your own conscience the moment they walk in the door. Think of what that does as a testimony for Christ, for his church. The testimony of the church is at stake. The testimony of Christ is at stake. And so we must remember, God sees all of this. He uses all of this. He knows every act of injustice, every moment of suffering you endure, every time you're taken advantage of. He knows all of these things. And when you bear up under it, trusting him, Paul calls these types of things light momentary affliction in light of the eternal weight of glory. Eternal rewards await you. God's glory is available through your life as you live faithfully All these things are wonderful gifts from the Lord. God sees it all. He knows it all. And he is just. We should be sobered by the justice to come for an unbelieving, unruly boss more than we're distraught for the inconveniences that it brings into our life. They will give an account. Before the Lord, there will be justice. Listen, this should be sobering if you're an employer. What kind of an employer are you? What kind of manager are you or boss are you? Are you treating your employees fairly, reasonably? Are you paying a fair wage? Are you being equitable? Are you being reasonable in what you're demanding and expecting and how you're treating your employees? We're not going to take the time tonight, but I encourage you to, on your own, go and read the book of Philemon. You see this very issue at work in wonderful ways where you've got a master who is a follower of Christ. His slave is not. His slave runs away. His slave comes to Christ, and Paul gives specific instruction for both the disposition of Philemon and his slave and how they're to interact and reconcile with one another and function in that relationship. So compelling, so helpful, and so encouraging to see the ways that the gospel penetrates our culture, our lives, the world that we live in. And by God's grace, we get to participate in this, be used to proclaim his excellencies. We get to live integrously in a way that shows the magnificence of God and his work in the gospel. So even in this call to submit to unruly masters, it is a privilege to get to do so for the name of Christ. Next week, we will see Christ as the perfect example who experienced the greatest injustice in his suffering. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. You are so clear. You are so helpful for us to put these things in front of us, Lord. We want to walk in your favor or walk in your grace, God. We want to trust you in all circumstances. Help us to be faithful under the authority that's in our lives, in our workplace. Help us to honor you. Help us to be self-controlled. Help us to have an eternal perspective that helps and, and guides us in the temporal moments where we're tempted to despair and to bitterness to grumble and to complain against uh, 
our circumstances and ultimately against you. Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified in our lives and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We